<clears throat> so hi everybody um thanks for um coming and joining this session hopefully you'll get a lot of insights into what our judges really look for in a winning entry um these sessions are for all organizations entering all sustainability awards um, but obviously as we're the global good awards um, i'm going to give you a little bit of intro on us if you don't know already as far as we're aware we are the um only truly sustainable awards program um, and we really do practice what we preach. So um, if you uh, want to know any more information about that, do have a quick look at our website. We were accredited uh, with the awards trust mark, which was first in the world to receive the gold standard. Um, and that mark is to recognize um, ethical and transparent practices and to build trust between entrants and, its, and the scheme. And from next month, um, we will be proud members of 1% uh, for the planet. So we'll be donating 1% um, of our turnover of all entries, sponsorship and ticket sales to 1% for the planet. And if you enter the Global Good Awards from this year onwards, we'll be doing a little um, promotion called um, Buy One, Get One Tree. So we'll, um, you enter our awards and for every entry, we'll be protecting a tree. We won't be planting, we'll be protecting one. So onto our categories. Um, we've got 17 categories this year. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, take a look at the website for all of those. But just a couple of um, new ones this year. We've in introduced COVID crisis champions, um, and that is free to enter for any organisation entering another category, and also to um, any um, public sector healthcare services um, anywhere in the world. And we've also added waste um, waste um, management and minimalisation, which has already proved to be um, pop quite popular so far on the system. Um, but today we're going to be talking about um, campaign of the year, behaviour change and employee engagement. And there's quite a lot of crossover um, between those. So our judges are going to be um, talking a little bit about that. <coughs> Before I come on to our judges, I'll just explain how the session will run. The judges will introduce themselves, qualify why they're on this session in particular. And then they're going to tell us a, little, um, a few things about what impresses them um, in an entry, what they like to see in a winning entry. And one thing that will, um, that will be marked down, what they don't want to see, or things that might, they might see missing when they're judging. <clears throat> then it's going to be over to you to drive the session with questions. So I hope you've come armed with some of those. Um, if, you, if you have questions, start answering them straight away. Don't, don't wait for me to say um, to go. <clears throat> um, there's no silly questions, just ask anything you like. Um, so yeah, we'll, and if you've got a confidential question, please ask it in the Q&A section under anonymous, but everything else, if it's open questions, please put it in under panellists and attendees in the chat. I'll moderate that and the judges will ask one of the judges um, to answer it. Um, it's being recorded, so um, you will be able to watch it later again. <clears throat> so we have 31, I think, amazing judges on our panel. Some of them have been with us since 2015, which is one of the um, um, judges we have with us today, and they absolutely refuse to give up their seats. So we've got a couple of real um, GGA stalwarts with tons of experience with us today, starting with Paula Rowan. She's um, been with us for seven years now, since the beginning of the Global Good Awards, and she supports um, supports us with a lot of um, help with category descriptions, criteria weighting, making sure our categories are right up um, and up to date. And we also have Georgina Stevens. She's been with us for five years now. Um, and returning after a two year break, we have Mark Jankovic. And last year, Mark won uh, a gold, two silvers and a one to watch. And he'll probably hold up his award if with any luck. There it is, our handmade um, fused glass award made from fragments of um, off and off cuts of glass. So um, let's go straight on to um, introductions and what you're looking for. So um, Paula, should we start with you? Yes. Well, good morning, everybody. It's um, great to be here and um, talking about the seventh Global Go uh, Good Awards um, process. So yes, I'm the one that's been with Karen from the start of her journey with, uh, with the awards. Um, and I've loved every moment of it. Um, we've learned a lot over the, the seven years of, of, um, of running them. Uh, so my background, I'm back in the day, I was a climate scientist and that's my training. But for the last decade or two, I've been concentrating more on education, behavioral change and campaigns. 
So I, I, I run two small companies. One is more a straightforward consultancy in environmental sustainability. And the other, more interestingly, is a uh, company that produces games, but they're educational games to help people understand and take action on um, planet saving um, issues. So that's the fun side of my life. Although for the last year, of course, I haven't had much time to play games with anybody because I'm not allowed. Okay, so if we go on to what I'm looking for in any entry. So what impresses me? It's not rocket science, but what impresses me if, is if the entrant answers the questions asked. And you might think it's a little bit of a silly thing to say, but so often the question asked isn't answered. There's a lot of waffle in the answer and, and it kind of if marketing and PR get hold of it, a lot of kind of um, PR bump, but not the answer to the question. So that's the first thing. Answer the question succinctly and, and honestly, and that will impress me. Um, another thing I'm quite hard on is every crucial point you want to get across has to be in that application. What I hate is being referred to documents that you add to your application. Sometimes those documents are huge. And we, we as judges are supposed to go and look for the right information, the relevant information you want to get across. I don't, I never will, because I don't think it's a fair playing field. Every entrant has the same number of questions to answer and the same number of words with which to answer those questions. And that is what I will make my decisions on primarily. So it's completely level in terms of you're all got a fair a number of, of words, word count, and you answer the same questions. So crucially, you have to get what you want me to know in your application form. Um, so conversely, what I will mark people down for, obviously, is the opposite to that. So waffle, an obvious PR um, wording, doesn't cut the mustard with me. I like facts. I'm a scientist. I like facts, figures, numbers. I like things um, verified as far as possible, kind of evaluation. Prove to me in the application that what you say is, is true and has happened. Um, <clears throat> and if there are lots of additional documents, or if I'm referred to websites, um, particular sort of areas of websites, Unless there is a really good reason for that, I won't read them. Anything outside of the application, I won't read. I will just mark you on what you have put in your application. Sometimes I do because, um, because the application um, kind of warrants a look, but I, I will judge you on what you've written rather than documents and, and websites. And um, I think that's about it in terms of what I'm looking for and what I'm kind of not looking for. Um, I'll stop there, but I'm obviously uh, keen to, to go deeper into this if you have any questions about my approach. Thanks, Paula. Right, we're gonna come on to Georgina. <clears throat> Hi everyone, I'm Georgina Stevens, as Karen said. Um, great to be here with you. Um, why am I a judge? I mean, you really have to ask Karen that, I think, but I think she's asked me. I mean, what I do currently is I write children's books and I, I write sitcoms, all with an environmental theme. Um, and I run a small organization called Be The Change and the books come under there, but we also run behavioral change engagement events as well. Um, and prior to that, the last 15 years of my career were spent working for big NGOs, big corporates, and running my own consultancy, sustainability consultancy. So I guess <clears throat> what I bring to the process is I've worked on a lot of campaigns myself, um, both from the NGO, NGO sector, but also in the corporate sector. 
Um, and with, with the wonderful hindsight that those 15 years give me, I look back and I see some of the ones that at the time seemed amazing, but actually they weren't the ones that lasted the test of time. And other smaller campaigns um, and behavior change campaigns and em employee engagement campaigns that, that really did. Um, and whilst working for um, within my own consultancy, I also worked on a number of different campaigns with both NGOs and, and corporates. So I guess I've seen a lot of campaigns come and go, and I've seen the ones that, that have lasted um, the test of time, as it were, which is always, always interesting and always surprising, actually. Um, in terms of what I'm looking for as a judge, um, like Paula, I'm pretty demanding. I mean, I'm so impatient. <laughs> I, if we're given huge appended documentation, I mean, I'm always so interested, but I have, you know, the time, <laughs> my, my time limit on how much I can read and take in um, is, isn't particularly long, I have to admit. But also I think it's, um, you know, as Churchill said, it takes, longer to write a short letter. Um, it's, it, it's just, I think, good, good um, practice to, to be able to write concisely. But I also, as a writer, I have to admit, I'm always looking for something really well written as well. And if you have run, you know, put the time and effort in um, to develop and find funding for this campaign, um, I really, I find it difficult when something doesn't just jump off the page in the first couple of lines. Um, sometimes that's just a shame, but, uh, and, and actually the campaign is, is really strong or the project is really strong, but um, I, think it, uh, I think it's a real false economy to not be able to do that because that, that comes through, you know, in all the communications, not just a, a judge's entry. Um, so yeah, this sort of the the obvious stuff aside. Of course, we're looking for those campaigns that can last the test of time, and that's what I'm always looking for, and the ones that have the big impact. But but I'm also I'm also always looking personally, and that I guess the great thing about the Global Good Awards is we always spend so much time discussing and debating as judges. This is just, we all have opinions, but when we get together to discuss our categories, that's where the interesting stuff comes out. And often, I mean, often it's Paula and I that disagree on certain things. And it's really interesting because that's where, I think that's where we can add the value, where we understand, you know, am I expecting too much from a beautifully written entry, for example? And Paula might say, yeah, but if you look at this, it's there. And that's, that's, what really, that's what's really useful. But for me, I'm also, you know, as an individual, I'm also looking for a little bit of humour in some of the campaigns as well. Um, and, and the creativity, it doesn't have to be new, but some creativity and maybe a little bit of humour in how it's presented as a campaign, not to us as judges, you don't have to write like stand up comedy in, in the application, although that's always fun. Um, but to to see that there's going to be some joy coming out of this campaign is always useful. And believe me, that's not always there, um, which is a shame. And I think, you know, we all realize in the world at the moment, we need some joy. So, you know, how is this campaign gonna spread joy? Um, I also love to see um, a community element and how perhaps community element isn't the right way of describing it, but I love to understand how a, a, a campaign is going to go beyond just, um, just the, you know, the initial target audience, whether that's an employee engagement program that's, you know, set to, set to engage employees, how can it engage those employees, families, how can your, um, energy campaign how can it grab people beyond that that first tier that I'm always interested in um, and courage I think is another thing I look for I love to see those campaigns where 
corporates have been courageous in what they're trying to do and it doesn't that doesn't need to be in terms of budget spend it needs to be in terms of their ambition and their vision and um and one thing that really puts me off is uh where i see um an organization just looking for credit for something which actually they should have done anyway so where we've got those gorgeous applications where a company is really stepping beyond its comfort zone and stepping beyond where perhaps we are as a society and just saying actually this is what we think we can achieve that's what I that's what I love to see um yeah and and as as Paula said yes ask us questions let's let's get into this but that's that's they're the kind of headline things I think for me thanks thanks Georgina yeah it did come up yesterday about um what you've just said about being put off by um, a corporate maybe taking credit for something that another organization like an agency has run a campaign for them they've taken yeah. the credit and all they've done is put the finance in um, there needs to be more substance to it than that um, so um, we'll come on to mark award-winning delphi seco thanks karen um, shout out to you first obviously for your your awards uh, I think they are amazing and very special and very different to a bit like what we're talking about today, which is there's lots of corporate greenwash. And I think what you do is completely true and honest. And that's and that's what, what we as judges are looking for. Um, so why am I a judge? Um, for those that don't know, I started my career in the city and gave up a decade ago to build a business that is all about trying to be net positive. Um, and for a decade, we've been making and promoting cleaning products that are all around sustainability in the commercial space. And that has been unbelievably hard. So that has been about campaigning, behavior change, awareness, all of these things that have needed to happen to educate society around, actually, there is a better way. So I, I think I probably am... Um, I have some credibility to come sit on the panel and and uh, and and look at awards and 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 like Georgina and Paul have said, time, we're all busy people uh, as are the people that are doing the the application. So keeping them succinct and to the point is, is super important. What do I look for? Two things that I think that step out for me are are has there been collaboration? So any project or anything that's been worked on, has somebody else been involved that's outside your business? Um, and then the second piece is, is it scalable? So can other people benefit from your innovation and your collaboration? It's not just an internal thing like, oh, look at me, you know, I've done this, great. If it's not, if it's not including communities and or other people around you and it isn't scalable, I don't think that's, you know, that's going to be a, a winning argument for me. Um, so disruptive tech, disruptive behavior, um, disruptive engagement with other people that is scalable is super, super, super interesting. Um, on the on the on the negative side, the self, I'm um, I think I'm probably just like Paula and, and Georgina. I'm I'm very very hard on on a waffly applications, uh, and I'm really hard on applications that are written by PR companies for big corporates that are not written by themselves and or by an employee within the company. That really annoys me because when you've got small businesses with limited employees who are doing their best and taking their time out to enter an award, and then you've got a, an application written by some big PR company who have been paid lots of money, that's not fair. So what I do is I immediately wait and give a higher weighting to the people that have written the application and put their heart and soul into it versus you know somebody who's just used somebody else to write the story for them um so so yeah i i put my own filter on that and then you know as we've discussed we then have a, a very punchy debate about who the winners should be which is always the most in interesting um element but yeah those are my those are my top tips Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I remember the last time you were on our panel a couple of years ago, it was quite a feisty and heated debate about some of the entries, which um, 
yeah I think it took a long time when I can't remember which category it was but it took a long time to get to the winners um yeah I think um talking about PR and marketing yes it's important to um have them look over it if you've got a PR and marketing department or team or agency um and especially when you're trying to get that attention of the judges early on if if you if you you, you know you need you need that input but you don't want to be taking the heart out of the entry you need that you need that emotion from the teams that have have driven and and you know driven that campaign so just make sure that you keep that in there um so i'd like to focus now a little bit on um while people are asking questions we've got um, quite a few people on the call so um make sure you start asking questions um the differences so last year i think we had about four or five entries that were in behavior change that we moved into different categories simply because it wasn't behavior change um so i think paula will come to you first and then just have maybe an open discussion about what behavior change is and what the difference is between employee engagement behavior change and and maybe overlapping into campaigns okay yes thank you karen um it's tricky because obviously there's there can be a lot of overlap depending on what you are doing so the three that we are concentrate the three categories we are concentrating more on today campaign of the year employee engagement and then behavioral change if you if you drew a venn diagram of those three um sorry gotta go to graphs and charts uh if you if you drew a venn diagram of those three you could find a very large kind of center piece where there, it's all three it's a campaign it has employee engagement and there obviously is a lot of behavior change in there because you're trying to um, change the behavior of your employees through a campaign, for example. But sometimes um, what we've seen in the past, particularly with behavioral cha change entries, there is no changing in behavior apparent in the entry. So I think people get a little bit confused about kind of educational uh, campaigns versus true behavioral change campaigns. So um, they go together, but you can stop at the educational piece. So you want to get the, the message out there. You want to tell people about this issue and you want to show people what's bad about the issue and, and why we should stop maybe doing something and do something else. But the element that actually proves that this particular initiative changes behavior is missing. So in that case, if we had one of those come through to us and a behavioral change, it would get marked down because there'd be no evidence of actual changes in behavior. And maybe we would suggest that um, entry gets moved into a different category, into, into a more of an educational um, focused category. So with the, behavioral, with the behavioral change category, you need to convince us that your initiative, your whatever it is you're doing, actually results in changes in behavior of your intended audience or audiences, whether that be staff, whether that be customers, clients, stakeholders. So that, that's quite kind of clear cut with behavioral change. We have to see some change. And, and um, Mark, with, oh, sorry, carry on Paula, sorry. With employee engagement, uh, of course, that is a mixture of education and hopefully behavioral change. Because if you're engaging your employees, your workforce, your staff, then um, truly you want them you want them to change something about their behavior at work. So um, then it's it's kind of up to you when you look at what, what categories you should enter. If you've got true behavioral change and true staff engagement, then maybe you have a choice of, of entries in terms of the categories. Um, but then campaigns, campaigns is in, in a way a much wider, uh, category because you could be campaigning on anything and there doesn't have to be behavioral change in there but it could be more educational 
or it could be just behavioral or more often than not there is there are elements of both but to, to enter a behavior change category you have to have evidence of that change in behavior so is that um, enough now, Karen? Yeah, no. Um, so, Mark, Georgina, um, can you give us some examples of what you want to see to prove that behaviour change, to prove that that's happened, and and how how you see that? Mark, you're like, uh, uh, Georgina's an answer. So, well, um, well, Georgina's pensively thinking. Um, I think the to Paula's point, it's about showing that there has actually been a result in any one of those three categories. So, so if it's a campaign, who's seen it? And what proof points do you have that it's actually been noticed? And, that, and that's really important for us as judges to go, okay, you know, we can see that this, is, this has been recognized, this has had an impact, this, this, you know, the, the corporate has, has put their back into it and done a really great, I mean, they've tried really hard. I mean, even, and that's where I think we as judges have an ability to go, you're a tiny SME with two people and you've done something and you've you've told a thousand people. That's amazing versus a Unilever who you know is vast and then tells a thousand people, they're not going to win. It'll be the smaller guys because they've actually had a bigger impact. Um, so it's about it's about proving the impact that that you're doing at, at the across all of those, whether it's employee engagement or just general behavior change that we can see and we can recognize and we can quantify. Uh, and I, I would say there is actually a linear, I love the Venn diagram, but I think there's one in, in, in those butterflies, there's the first one is the campaign. So the campaign is, you know, shout out about the big topic and then you get into behavior change and then you get into employee engagement. And it, it kind of rolls and it, it, in my mind, it rolls in that direction. And, and then, you know, it, it then it opens out and society is, has basically adopted what started off as a as a weird and wacky idea. Um, but yes, being able to quantify and prove that is what's important. Mm. And Georgina, just coming on to you, but um, one thing picking up from Mark about proving it is you're quite often PR and marketing departments will use big numbers. Yeah. The judges will see through those big numbers if they don't mean anything. Um, and when we're talking about not meaning anything, we're talking about reach and impressions. They won't be impressed with that. Um, yeah, you know, an, imp an impression on a tweet could be multi-millions, but actually if anyone's seen it and acted on it is what we're looking for. Yeah, I don't know if there's much more to add to that. I was, that's what I was going to say. Social media numbers are just there that that can't do it sadly we need to see that you know people have changed their bank accounts people have changed their energy providers whatever the the campaign is around we need to see those numbers and i think it's it's not it's not easy to to provide compelling evidence in the first flush of a campaign you know it often needs a couple of years after that campaign is run to really see the numbers and to really see the impact and i think i have to say i think a few agencies perhaps or all corporates are a little bit um eager to to put their campaigns forward and actually they need they need to wait a year till they've really got the figures i think we've had quite a lot of entries campaigns have been fantastic but the evidence hasn't been there and that makes it really tricky for us because we might love what they're trying to do but the evidence just isn't there and I think the behavior change category is the, the most difficult from that point of view. How would you see collecting that evidence so what sort of ideas I mean if if, if um, you want to know that loads of people have changed their bank account or or reduced their plastic at their in their home by 30 percent how, how do you go about finding that out Georgina? Yeah, it's really tricky. It, it depends the parameters you're setting up. You, I think you have to have wider numbers from beyond your campaign to, you know, if you're talking about who's changed their bank account, those, you know, those figures are available on a wider perspective, um, but they're not, you know, yeah, you can't necessarily just tie that down to that one campaign either. Um, you can obviously ask people to make pledges, that's always useful, um, but you need to follow up on those pledges. You can't just have people say, yeah, I've cut, you know, I've stopped doing 
X, Y, and Z, you need to be able to quantify it six months later to, to show us that that behavior change has been maintained. And I think also campaigns like um, the Starbucks 5P on a coffee cup campaign, for example, um, I think that's a really powerful behavior change campaign. Um, and, you know, the figures there, it's easier for them to provide the figures because it's, it's their business. Everything is contained within them. They know, you know, how many people are bringing in reusables. Um, so I guess, I guess the, the point is that some, in some ways, it's a lot easier to quantify behavior change than others. And, and you need to think that through right at the beginning of the campaign. Okay. Can I just add to that, um, following on from what Tadina has said, I think a, a golden rule is to bake in to any plan your evaluation at the start. You see so many campaigns, initiatives, projects, programs that are doing great things, but they didn't think about the evaluation at the start. And so when they're asked for the evaluation at the end to, to supplement any award entries, they're scrambling around for the data post the, the, the activity. So it's, this, is, this is not really to do with awards per se, but it's, it's just uh, um, a golden rule to absolutely bake in your evaluation at the start so you know what type of data you need to collect, both, both qualitative and quantitative, and then you are kind of uh, well, baking in success because you can then prove what you are trying to do because you've, you've had it there, you've had that plan from the start. Cool. Um, Mark, can I come to you? Talk, talk to me about um, so on our website. We're, we're, I don't I don't know many other awards that um, tell people what the criteria and the weighting points are on the descriptions of of categories, um, and they, they vastly vary between um, scalability and replicability being like fifteen percent, right up to outcomes and impact being forty percent. Talk to me about the importance of um, entrance, making sure they put the right amount of input into each of those sections. I've lost him. <laughs> well, yeah, just thinking about it. As a, as a winner, as a gold winner. Yeah, I think that every entry is incredibly hard. I mean, I've written lots of them and they, you, you put your heart and soul into each one and they trying to get the the right information across in the right place is hard. So, you know, everybody that, that's listening, we know this is a tough job. Um, and, and us as judges take it incredibly seriously because we know how much time and effort has, has gone into it. Um, but, you know, to Paula's point right in the beginning, put the right information in the right place. Um, and, you know, start with, you know, cut the waffle out and get, get your, your key points across really, really quickly and then back them up. Um, and that that will get you up the pile or up the list super quickly because you know that, that we don't want to sit and read 15 pages of you know something that isn't telling us what we really need to know in, in the first paragraph um so you know get our attention and then in the different sections put the backup in but you know write it write it succinctly and, and powerfully and you, 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 you've got a really good chance. Yeah, I mean, um, as I say, some of the sections are for output um, and impact. If you score scoring seven out of 10 for that is going to be more powerful in your average score at the end than getting 10 out of 10 for something that's 10 or 15%. So make sure you really do read that description and criteria and make sure that you apply the right amount of time, detail, and evidence and word count according to that, according to that, um, that percentages. Um, talking of word count, talk to me about word count, Paula. We've got a word count on all our entries. How do you how do you feel that goes sometimes? <laughs> um, 
I can't remember. Do we we don't cut people off at a we, don't cut people off. we tell them well, yeah, we, we tell them that there is a, I think it's something like a twelve hundred and fifty or fifteen hundred um, word count, but um it, it doesn't cut off. So they sometimes they do they do go over. Um I can't recall anybody who's really abused it in the in the entries I've seen over the years. Um I think it's more that people don't cut to the chase in the application because they are just linking. And that's the annoying thing. So I don't think we have a problem so much with word count in the application. It's just maybe that word count isn't really considered as the be all and end all, because of course you can you can just put a load of additional pieces of information um, in with your entry. So, uh, but it might be an idea to cut off the word count at a thousand words or 1500 words or whatever it is for each category. That would solve that, that one. Yeah, it would <laughs> possibly would, yeah. Um, okay, so um, talk to me about being open. Um, challenges, are you facing challenges? Um, we've, we've picked up on a couple of the other sessions that if people have um, faced challenges, they haven't said what they are. They've just sort of glossed over them. How you know? How important is it to sh to share with us that you faced a challenge, mm. and how you've dealt with it? Who wants to take that? I could start because I love reading about what went wrong. <laughs> it's so much more educational and insightful than reading. Oh, this went well. This went well. This went perfectly. You know, nobody else will learn anything from a perfect campaign. And we all know nothing ever goes to plan, the original plan. So I really love to read about those unexpected hiccups and how they caused you to have to think again, think around it, be creative in the solution, because they are so so useful lessons learned for, for others and we're all about sharing the kind of the the best practice here and sharing the love and sharing the 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 practice that didn't turn out as it should so other people don't make the same mistakes so i'm all for being honest about the shall we call them the challenges and how you overcame them don't don't gloss over them georgina yeah, just to add to that, um, I, can you hear me okay? Just to add to that, I was just gonna say, of course we want to see that you've shared those challenges beyond the award application as well, because that's where the real learning takes place. Obviously it's great for us to see it, but um, needs to be shared further and wider. So yeah, of course, I think I, it's really important to be honest um, and, and show us the, the real side of this campaign um yeah absolutely but obviously stick within the word count <laughs> tell us what you would do differently next time that's i think that and show us on the back of that learning show us how you will improve the campaign going forward and that shows a longevity to the vision of the campaign and the organization's vision of that campaign which is exactly what we want to see we don't want to you know think that if something small falls over in the campaign that it will be that's it cut and then to move on to the next we want to see you know i think we all said at the beginning we want to see longevity of these campaigns mm. it, it actually came out yesterday with one of the judges that if they don't hear about your challenges if there's no challenges in the application form they almost won't believe it and they'll go looking for some and they'll start to wonder why there wasn't any <laughs> So, you know, especially with campaigns, wow. things are Great. things don't always go right. So you've got to assume there were some challenges. So what were they? Um, I think the, the, you know, the point that I kind of made right at the beginning, my, my, my two hot buttons are collaboration and scale. If you don't talk about how you can scale this, then you're not telling anybody what the problems are because everything... You know, that's the roadmap of don't do this, do that. Um, and I think that's super important in an application to say, you know, what I've, what I've kicked off here is going to do this and 
you know, these are the things to look out for. So um, guys, we haven't had any questions yet. Um, so please ask away. We've, um, we've got about 10 minutes left before we'll probably finish off. So maybe we're just answering it all for you. You just don't have any questions, but this is ask the judges. So um, do, um, do come in. So um, just while we, we might wait for a couple, um, Paula, um, there's been a few times where we've we've had discussions about um, entries coming in with sort of empty claims and using words like um, significant and immensely, you know, changes and stuff. How, uh, but they don't qualify what they mean by that. Talk to me about that. T tell me, tell me about, you know, it's quite often PR and marketing words that come out and they just say we've made significant changes, and then it just stops. Yeah, well, that obviously doesn't cut the mustard, does it? Um, <laughs> and also, you know, it's really, really easy to to see where something's been written by a, a PR or marketing agency. It's there's just a kind of a a style to it. Uh, there's a lot of style and a corresponding lack of substance usually, and it's kind of you know you get you see a lot of these entries coming through and to begin with in our first kind of cut um we just glance through them all you know we also we have to just do a quick glance through them all so that we know we put them into well, this is the way i work go through them all quickly just just a quick eye not a deep deep dive read put them into two piles with uh the ones that i'm going to look at more carefully the ones that are going to be rejected at first, at first pass. Um, so you get to see a lot of them and you get really used to the style over substance um, approach to, to and, and some things that are a little bit too glossy. And, and, and of course, all these kind of words, I, I use the term weasel words where you're using words that seem to mean a lot, but they don't mean anything really. And so precision in in your language is 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 paramount and then backing up any claim make sure you have backed it up with with what actually happened so um yeah cut the the hyperbole and um just get down to the to the nitty-gritty of, of of what you've done and the word hyperbole came up yesterday exactly that word that was hill <laughs> Hill from Iceland used that word yesterday, which is quite apt. Um, I'm gonna, Mark, we're going to come on to you in a second, um, just about keeping jargon, um, sector-based jargon free, because our, um, the judges are experienced in, you know, a lot of things, but they might not necessarily know your sector. So uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to come back to you on that in a minute. But we have had one question. Um, we're talking a lot about campaigns on a corporate level. Will we be considering local level and community campaigns too? Who would like to? Georgina, do you want to cover that? I mean, it's well, I think I think all of these, everything we're talking about relates also to community level campaigns. We're still looking for, you know, the the um, the stats. We're still looking for the well written entry, concise entries, the impact but just on a on a different scale and at a different level. So I think everything we've said is is um, is relevant. I don't know if that answers the question, but um, yeah, and yeah, we, do, we um, do a lot of community campaigns. We will look at the our judges are very well briefed on the fact that um, if there is a large corporate that's had a, a relatively big impact um, we, and a small community group that's had a massive impact based on the resources that they've put in they often will win over the corporate and I the, um, the judges are very well briefed on that and they won't just give it to the the, the overall biggest campaign regardless of resources and I guess to add to that we're, everything's we're... always taken context yeah, yeah. Sorry. Paula and um, with with local campaigns and community campaigns the um, integrity and the heartfeltness of of the entries come through because of course they're not using these PR and marketing agencies to do it for them but it's coming from it's coming from them so 
it's easy to see the integrity come uh, sort of flow through from from local level or community campaigns saying that some of the charity entries we get through um, are very slick and PR and marketing kind of driven and maybe agency written. So um, it's interesting to see the commercialization of some charitable entries. Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're not obviously um, putting off PR and marketing input because that's absolutely vital. Um, but what we're trying to say is just don't take the heart and the emotion out of your entry make sure that they they wrap it, but they don't take it away. Um, so Mark, let's come back to jargon. Talk to me about jargon filled entries and, and fancy words and, and, and confusing the judges. If I can just go back to that question. I remember it was the last one I was, I was judging. The, there was a individual who was taking older people or disabled people into a forest and teaching them or teaching them in, 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 in nature and, and doing an amazing community spirit um, piece in a, in a village with disabled people in a forest. And it was a fabulous entry and they were competing against Unilever on something else. And so to the person who's asked the question, we debated head to head one person doing one thing in a forest in a village. Um, they didn't win because it wasn't scalable. It was amazing and it was a hard debate. Um, they didn't win because it wasn't massively scalable and it was very micro. It was still a great thing. Unilever didn't win either. Um, but the point is that we were debating, you know, a $60 billion business versus one person in a village um, going against each other. And so just to, to that individual's question, 100%, we are very focused on, on all activity, doesn't matter how small it is, um, if it has an impact and it's going to change you know, lives and direction of travel, we're all over it. So, so to give them that confidence. I mean, I think jargon, yes, I mean, jargon's annoying for, for any judge um, and to write things out in, in, the, simplest, in the simplest manner is, is super important. And I think if you've got a good campaign, um, you're going to be able to describe it relatively succinctly. And, and one of the, um, I'm sure it's, I'm sure everybody's heard the same thing, but you know, I got taught this a long time ago. If you can't explain it to your grandmother, it's too complicated. So, you know, over, overlay, if I can't explain it to my grandmother really easily, it's too complicated. So they just don't put it down. Um, and, and in life in general, that really is quite a good litmus test. Yeah, um, one of our judges on the first first webinar actually um, calls it ELI five. Explain like I'm five. I thought that was quite interesting. So um, yeah, so um, guys, you haven't got any other questions. So um, judges, have you got any final words, closing words to say um, while you're thinking? If anyone's got any questions about. Um, the differences any any further I'm always on the end of the phone or email you always get a reply from me and if I can't answer it I will come to one of these lovely judges to answer it for me um, and I'll come back to you with a concise answer so um, Georgina closing words oh I'm looking forward to this year's entries and reading through them and debating them with the rest of my fellow judges yeah, keep them concise and give us the stats and yeah, and keep the heart in it. And yeah, <clears throat> I think that's that's the main thing for me. Paula. Um, yes, everything uh, Georgina has said and um, just just yeah, just be genuine and yourselves and tell us how it was and I'm always a um, supporter of the perceived underdog so um, if you're small and community minded then you know <laughs> <laughs> Mark we're going to have to have a little smoke screen going I'm not a big corporate I'm a tiny little SME <laughs> because, uh, because the big corporates don't win please don't assume that they do yeah, um, it is always a mixture and it's always very open and even. 
No, I think my, my, I just love, love, love going through the applications, all of them, because they're all massively inspiring. Uh, and there's so much good stuff going out there. And I always, I always wish that there were, you know, ways that we could amplify some of the amazing work that's going on. And it isn't just the winners. And I think, Karen, what you do by promoting all of this and giving everybody airtime, I think is amazing because there is some, even if you, you know, you don't win, it's our job to make sure that everybody gets a, um, gets noticed that they have put an application in and they have got something interesting to say because all applications have got something interesting to say. Thank you, Mark. Right, guys, well, I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, thank you, judges. Thank you for everyone for joining us. Um, we'll be putting up the recordings by Monday, hopefully, um, and they'll all be on the Ask the Judges um, page on the website. So any questions, um, do drop me an email and I look forward to receiving your in um, entries. Take care. Great weekend. Bye, guys. Bye.